You got a light, buddy? Yeah, sure, kid. There you go. And your wallet. Nick, give him your wallet. What for? He's got a knife. <laughs> That's not a knife. That's a knife. A good knife is sharp, is safe, is fast, and is accurate. Hi, my name is Peter Dowd, founder and principal consultant at Anago, the world leader in sharpness measurement. I'm based in New Zealand with my wife and two sons and have extensive experience in injury prevention, processing efficiency, and product development. I have had the privilege of leading the New Zealand health and safety forums for both the meat and seafood industries. I have led a wide range of industry projects, ranging from knife sterilization to pituitary gland extraction, injury data analysis, to new beef jerky products, and of course, knife sharpness. With world first innovations in a variety of areas and over two decades of applied research into knife sharpness, Anago has become a global name with customers in almost every continent. Today, we will look at the impact of a sharp knife, what makes a sharp knife, how best to obtain and maintain a sharp knife, and the extraordinary impact of sharpness measurement. With musculoskeletal injuries, there are three key risk factors, effort, opportunity for recovery, and health. Effort relates to the forces that we need to apply and the moment generated by the distance of the force from our joints. For example, a 20 pound carton is easier to carry close to our body than at arm's length. Opportunity for recovery is impacted by how long we need to apply the force and how frequently. If we only carry the 20 pound carton once an hour, we should have ample time for our muscles to recover. But if we are pushing a dull knife thousands of times a day, it is likely that our tissue will not be able to recover between exertions and gradual damage will occur. When we do get an opportunity to recover, our rate of recovery is influenced by the ability of our body to be able to refresh the tissue by transferring harmful waste products away from our muscles and to transfer nutrients and oxygen in. When our vascular system is inefficient, for example in someone who has cardiovascular disease, or who has constricted blood vessels due to smoking, the system is less effective and gradual damage is more likely. What we can see here is a graph showing time in seconds on the horizontal axis and force on the vertical axis. This graph was generated using an instrumented handle that measured the actual forces being applied by someone performing meat cutting tasks. Both lines represent the same task being performed by the same person. The blue line was when they were given a dull knife and the orange line a sharp knife. The difference in force is extraordinary, but not only that, the task was also slower with a dull knife and so the person is in the unfortunate position of not only having to apply more force for longer, but having less time in between tasks for their muscles to recover. We see that substandard sharpness causes increased grip forces and moments, insufficient opportunity for recovery, and reduced vascular efficiency. Clench your fist with me for a few seconds. One, two, three, and four. And then open it up. And look at your palm and fingers. See the white areas? This is where blood isn't flowing and creates opportunity for damage if we need to maintain high grip forces for long periods of time. However, sharp knives enable faster processing, increased quality due to improved accuracy of cuts possible because the person doesn't have to push so hard, and increased yield. Not only do we get higher absolute yield, meat off the bone, but we also get an increase in what I call effective yield, which is the proportion of meat that stays on valuable cuts rather than being lost to trim. When someone's knife slips while boning, the slice into the product must be trimmed to maintain the appearance of the product, and this trimmed meat goes from perhaps 
$20 per pound to potentially less than a dollar. These graphs show the results from a study at a global processor looking into the impact of sharpness testing. With the top graph illustrating the results of a comfort survey, showing that at the beginning of the study, most people were hurting a lot most of the time. By the end of the three-month study, knives were considerably sharper, with the astonishing result that not only did discomfort almost disappear and injuries drop to zero, but the team members were so much more efficient that they were able to process high-value product that required 30% more cuts per minute while maintaining an injury rate of zero. We also discovered during our preliminary survey that even when these people are suffering a lot of pain, they don't tend to tell anyone. One day, they just don't turn up. We can understand the impact on throughput like this. Let's say we have a processing line with people who can cut at different speeds. The speed of the overall team is limited by its slowest member, in this case, to eight cuts per minute. Now, if we can improve the speed of just the slowest member by improving their knife sharpness so they can process at the speed of even the next slowest, the entire team experiences a huge productivity boost. In this case, a 25% improvement. It's this phenomenon that explains the enormous productivity boosts people see when they start to focus on knife sharpness. This graph shows the range of knife sharpness levels in New Zealand 20 years ago before we began our work on sharpness measurement. In every country that we have worked in, the results are the same. About 10% of people are true artisans, able to keep an amazing edge. However, the rest of us vary from average to truly awful. The worst knives require as much as 16 times the effort to use than the best. It was these results that revealed to us that we didn't need to improve the best, but merely enable the rest to get close to them. Awareness of the critical nature of knife sharpness has been increasing globally through all levels of processing operations and across a wide range of meat processors and their suppliers. Sharpness is now difficult to ignore. We now come to the theory of sharpness. We will cover what cutting is, the impact of edge roughness and angle, what we aim to achieve from the various steps in the sharpening process, and the impact of blade length. Sharpness is essentially the ability to cut a material with a minimum amount of force. Our goal is to separate the atoms of the material that we are cutting. And this is made easier by increasing the stress concentration at the cutting point. The tighter the radius at the cutting point, the easier it is to separate the material and therefore the less effort we need to apply to our knife. Another way to increase stress concentration at the cutting point is to pull on the material being cut. And we often see people doing this as they slice meat in an effort to reduce the cutting forces needed. The three micrographs at the top of the slide show three different levels of edge roughness under magnification. The coarse edge was a 400 grit finish with no steeling. The smooth, a 600 finish with steeling. And the polished, a 1000 thousand grit polish with steeling. For all tasks evaluated, the polished edge resulted in lower grip and cutting forces and yielded a higher sharpness score. Our recommendation is to prepare knives to as smooth an edge as you can justify the time to do. Edge angle and blade thickness impact the ease with which the cutting edge can contact the actual surface being cut. The product being cut has a large impact on the optimum edge angle depending on its ability to flow away from the cutting line, with a more rigid product requiring a narrower edge angle and overall blade width to enable the cutting edge to touch the cut line and ensure slicing rather than tearing of the product. The basics of the sharpening process are well known. A good sharpening process starts with grinding to prepare an edge, honing to sharpen the edge, polishing to finish the edge, and steeling to maintain the edge. 
The most effective systems also include measurement of sharpness to enable closure of the quality control loop. The purpose of grinding is typically not to generate a sharp edge, but rather to prepare the blade for honing. Common grinding methods are flat, hollow, and parallel. Hollow and parallel grinds enable honing to be limited to a small section of the edge that moves up the blade, while a flat grind requires the entire side to be honed to generate the cutting edge. Honing is the process by which we generate the cutting edge, and it can be performed in a multitude of ways, from manual oiled stones to robotic sharpening machines. The key requirements of good honing technique are to maintain a constant angle, to take into account the curvature of the blade, and to incorporate firm, gentle strokes that enable as smooth a finish as possible. As we use a knife, the cutting edge bends over. It's still sharp, but the added curvature at the edge increases the force required to cut. When stealing a knife, we are merely straightening the edge and maintaining it. We have already prepared it via honing. We are not trying to remove metal. The cutting edge is microscopic, and if steel correctly requires very little force to straighten. Steeling should be performed at the same angle as the original edge, be very gentle, and utilize a smooth steel so that we do not damage the edge by removing metal. This sharpness graph is common and illustrates the impact of poor honing technique. The tip score is low with improved scores along the flat of the blade. It is also interesting to note that a score of approximately 7.8 will pass the paper test and a score of about 8.4 will shave. And yet there is a whole world of sharpness above these levels, a world where cutting becomes easy. I cannot emphasize enough how critical online stealing is to overall sharpness levels. A good knife can be ruined literally within minutes by poor stealing. And that will then be the sharpness used for the rest of the shift. Effective management of online stealing equipment and techniques is crucial to an optimum sharpening system. This graph shows the change in sharpness levels at one of our customers over the first three months of implementing sharpness testing at their facility. When we first arrived, the sharpness levels were around 6.5. It took a day to get a computer, and during this day, the sharpening staff experimented and improved their techniques such that within one day they had improved their scores to above seven. Within a week, they had improved to around eight, a reduction of over 75% in the force required to use the knives. After a month, they were able to get their equipment maintained, and you can see the immediate improvement this made. In fact, around this time, the sharpeners themselves decided that no knife would leave the knife room under 8.5, an astonishing improvement in only five weeks, especially considering this was achieved with the same people using the same equipment. The only difference was that they were now incorporating measurement and the feedback it enables. The chart at the top left is from another of our customers and illustrates very clearly the rapid improvement in both sharpness levels and their consistency after the implementation of sharpness measurement. The lower chart of used knives shows the impact on online stealing of just a brief break from testing when the same customer forgot to order test media. Not only did the average sharpness levels drop significantly, but the range of sharpness levels of used knives was all over the place. Managing knife sharpness effectively requires knowledge of what is happening, not only at a local level, but also at a corporate level. The ability to capture and present data in accessible dashboards greatly enhances the ability of facilities and corporate offices to know what is going on and when to intervene. That's all we have time for today. Knife sharpness is a critical component in a safe and efficient processing operation and awareness of the need to control it is growing globally. Feel free to contact me at the address shown with any questions and remember, you can't control what you can't measure.